Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer. Uh, well, I guess for you, it's Wednesday night. For me, it's Sunday. Uh, I apologize that I've had to pre-record uh, a couple of weeks in a row. Last week, I was at a funeral in Florida. Uh, this week, I am in Lakeland uh, at Southeastern for uh, some classes trying to wrap up my master's program. Uh, but tonight, we are going to jump into the second part of Jonah. We are going to be in the first chapter, and uh, here in one moment, we're going to read through the extent of it. Uh, as I said last week, uh, we will basically, from here on out, we will take chapter by chapter and go through it. Tonight, we will be in Jonah 1, next week, Jonah 2, then 3, then 4, uh, as we wrap up. But if you have your Bible, or you can watch on the screen with us, we're going to go ahead and begin by reading Jonah chapter 1. The scriptures say this, the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. But Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down in it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached Jonah and he said, what are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up, call out to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business and where are you from? What's your country and what people are you from? And Jonah answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to Jonah, what have you done? The men knew that he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I'm to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men dug in and rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. And so they called out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with innocent blood for you, Lord, have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. And then the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and for three nights. Now, Father, we thank you so much for the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord that comes to Jonah, but the word of the Lord that comes to us. And even Tonight, as we open your scripture, we pray that the spirit of the Lord would uh, bring revelation to us, that you would help us to have understanding, um, not only of our own condition, but of the Father's heart and all that you have for us. I want to pray your blessing over our time tonight and for your destiny to be fulfilled for every person listening tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. I remember being in uh, the seventh grade and uh, I went to a middle school that had uh, pre-algebra courses. I don't even know if they have those courses today, but it had a pre-algebra class. And uh, in seventh grade, I was in this class and our uh, teacher, I won't say his name, um, but our teacher was a mammoth of a man. He was uh, probably six, four, six, five, weighed, well over 300 pounds, just a, a brute man, just incredibly strong. He was a football coach. And uh, I remember uh, being in his class with a couple of my friends and um, 
We absolutely despised algebra, still do, uh, despised the class, but also despised the teacher. He wasn't a very uh, gentle giant. Uh, he was pretty hardline. He was, you know, pretty direct and disciplinary oriented. And uh, I remember after being in his class a few months, uh, me and a couple of friends, we decided that, that we were going to spend the weekend together. I was going to go over to their house. And uh, I knew that these friends were not the best influence uh, for me, but I really wanted to be, you know, in with them and I wanted to be accepted by them and different things. And so I was able to convince my mom. And on that Friday afternoon after school, we left and we went over to uh, uh, one of the friend's house. And like teenage boys do, there came a certain point in the night where we just got just so bored. We got so bored. And uh, you know that when young teenage boys are together, it's late at night and it's bored, that trouble is not far away. And um, so we sat there and we were talking about what we should do and the different options that we had. And all of a sudden, uh, we will call him uh, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith's name came up. And we began to talk about him and how much we despised him and didn't like him and how mean of a guy he was and all this kind of stuff. And one thing led to another. And the next thing I knew at 2 a.m. on that Friday night, well, I guess Saturday morning, about two o'clock in the morning, we were on the phone calling this man in the form of a prank call. The man answered the phone in a stupor, you know, out of his sleep. And uh, we held the phone in between the three of us and we just started railing on him. And we started calling him every name in the book. We started talking about how bald he was and how dumb he was and how much we hated him and all this kind of stuff. Um, now, keep in mind, we were, we were 13 year old boys. We never even once thought maybe we should disguise our voice or uh, maybe we should, you know, put a t-shirt over the phone to kind of muffle our voices or anything. No, we were just going and full bore, we were going all at it. So we just, we were on the phone and we let him have it for like two minutes. We just went off. Well, he kind of sat there in silence and, and we set our piece and then we hung up and, uh, you know, we giggled like little girls and we thought it was the funniest thing. And um, so anyway, we ended up falling asleep after that. And I went home the next day and Monday rolls around and um, we show up to school. And before his class is even in session, um, I get uh, called up to the dean's office and uh, dean's office. I go up there and my mom and dad are there in the dean's office. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if someone had died or what was going on. But basically um, the teacher had, had known that the three of us were going to be spending the weekend together. He knew that we did not like him. Uh, he had overheard us talking about spending the weekend together. And if all of those things didn't line up, uh, he basically could distinguish our voices um, from anybody else in any of his other classes. So he proceeded to call our parents, to call them in, and uh, basically had told our parents what we had done. And we had all denied it while we were all together. And then when they separated us and started questioning us, you know, the, the, the story began to unravel. And we had no defense. We had nothing. We were all found guilty. And uh, we ended up being paddled, each of us in his class. It wasn't in his classroom for all the peers to see, but what they did during that block, the dean called the three of us and the teacher out into the hallway and he paddled us against the wall where everybody in the class could hear. I'll never forget. I was, the dean told us to put our hands against the wall and he told us to look at our right thumb and, and not to look back or anything. And I went, um, I, I braced myself because I knew it was coming because again, this is a giant of a man. And this man swatted my tail so hard. He physically, my physical body came off the ground and it hurt so bad. And I turned around and looked and the Dean was laughing his face off at me. And as soon as he turned me, saw me turn around, he said, turn around, face the wall. And I did. And, I got my other two licks and uh, so did the other boys and, and we kind of went on. But, um, you know, as we look at the book of Jonah, uh, Jonah finds himself in a very, in a very similar predicament. Uh, he was definitely in the wrong place and he was definitely doing the wrong thing. And just like for me and my friends, uh, it did not end well for Jonah. It did not go the way that Jonah had thought. And so tonight what we're going to do is 
look and kind of dissect a little bit of, of chapter one. And as we look at Jonah's adventure, I think it's really important for us. I heard a man say one time, when you go through the Bible, make sure that the Bible is going through you. And I think it's just so important that we not develop a mentality that says, well, I just need to do my reading plan. I need to get through the scriptures. But we need to be very diligent to, to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to us through the scriptures. And as we do that tonight, I believe that the spirit of God is going to speak to us and teach us some lessons that that are going to be beneficial for all of us, really. But before we get to that, before we get to some just basic observations about this first chapter, I think it's important for us to understand really part of what was at the core of, of Jonah, of his issue. And I believe that it was as simple as saying this, that Jonah had not understood what lordship meant to his God. He was a prophet. He was a successful prophet. But as we read the scriptures, what begins to come more and more to light is that Jonah was willing to be obedient to what God had called him to as long as God called him to what Jonah wanted to be called to. But the moment that God called Jonah to do something contrary to what Jonah wanted, Jonah began to buck. Jonah began to deflect a little bit. So lordship was definitely an issue for Jonah. It wasn't the knowledge of God. As, as we read through this portion and really the whole book of Jonah, there are some things that we find out about him as, as, a, as a person, as a man. Uh, the first thing that we find out is that Jonah knew God's word. Here next week, we're going to dig into to Jonah chapter two. And uh, as, as Jonah is in the belly of this great sea creature, Jonah begins to pray this prayer. It's nine verses long. But in those nine verses, 11 different times, Jonah quotes or refers to the scripture that had been written before him. Some from the book of Psalms, some from Lamentations. Jonah has the word of the Lord that has been buried in his heart. He's a prophet of God. He's a learned man. He knows the scriptures. He understands what's going on in God's word. So um, Jonah's, Jonah's issue was not that he didn't have exposure to the word of God. It also wasn't that Jonah didn't know the will of God. It's, it's incredibly clear. Um, the, Bible, the Bible says uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and spoke specific instructions to Jonah. It, it wasn't just the, the revealed will of God that Jonah knew through God's word, but it was the hidden will of God, the very specific word of God that it came to Jonah and Jonah refused to do it. So it wasn't that Jonah didn't know God's word. It isn't that Jonah didn't know God's will, but it also wasn't that Jonah didn't know God's ways. Jonah clearly, by the time we get to, to chapter four, the scripture says Jonah is, is talking after God has saved the Ninevites. And Jonah says, I knew this about you, Lord. I knew your ways. I knew that you were going to be compassionate. I knew that you were going to be merciful. I knew that you were going to refrain from destroying these people if I preached to them. And Jonah was frustrated about it. But the point of what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that Jonah had exposure to the word of God. He knew the word of God. He knew the, the will of God. No doubt he knew the will of God but he also understood the ways of God. But even with all of this knowledge, even with all of this supernatural revelation, even with, with all of this combined and culminating in a moment, Jonah still refused to obey what the Lord had called him to. And the reason is because Jonah did not understand the Lordship factor. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she understood what lordship truly meant. You remember when Jesus is at the wedding at Cana and, and people are celebrating and, and Jesus is about to perform his first miracle that we have written in scripture. Mary goes over to the servants and, and she gathers them. She says, come in quick, listen, listen just really closely. I know there's a lot going on. I know there's a grand celebration, but do you see that man over there? Whatever he says to you, do it. 
Whatever he says to you, it, he may ask you to do some ridiculous things. He may ask you not to do some things that you think that you should do or to do some things that you shouldn't, you think you shouldn't do. Whatever he says to you, do it. And in that moment, we have the mother of Jesus himself falling under the lordship of Christ saying, saying, fellas, listen to me, servants, listen to me. It doesn't matter if you understand or not what he's asking you to do. Just simply do it because to, to paraphrase a little bit of what Eugene Peterson once said, he said this, he said, sometimes we don't understand the Bible until we obey it. And I would just kind of shift that a little bit for tonight's purposes and say this, that sometimes we can't understand what God is doing until we obey what he is asking us to do. Mary may not have understood, the servants may not have, have understood why Jesus was, was asking them to do all of these things. But she said, listen, it doesn't matter whether you understand or not, just simply do what he's asking you to do and everything else will fall into place at the right time. And so we've got to understand that, that for, for us personally, for Jonah himself, even with, with, with being in a supernatural environment, even with having a, a deep devotion to the word of God and understanding and knowledge of what God's called us to do, that Jonah as an individual still had the responsibility not only to hear what the Lord was saying, but also to heed what the Lord was saying. And for us that are here tonight, it is our responsibility not just to know the word of God, right? It's, it's not just to know the will of God or, or the ways and the loving compassion of God, but it's on us to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying and to heed what he's saying by doing what he's saying. And this is, this is what happens when we do that. This is a great cyclical blessing that happens. The more that, that we hear and heed what the Spirit of God is saying to us, the more we heed, the more we will hear, right? So, so if I hear the Lord speaking to me and I heed his voice and I do what he's calling me to do, it is very likely that I am gonna hear him more often and the more that I heed, the more that I will hear. It is the, the sheer difference between knowing and doing. Right? Jonah knew the word of God. He knew what God was calling him to do, but he refused to do it. So his knowledge did not equate to action. And that's really where Jonah fell apart, right? So as Jesus is sitting at, at the Passover meal, Jesus goes and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. You remember this. He goes and he washes them. Peter says, no, I'm never going to let you. And Jesus says, you must let me. And so Jesus goes and washes all the disciples' feet. And following this event, listen to what Jesus told his disciples. He said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. Right? He didn't say, if you know these things, Blessed are you if you know these things, right? That's not what he said. He said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. James, the, the half brother of Jesus would, would later in, in his book, in his epistle, he would, he would just kind of pop us in the mouth with a statement like this. He would say, do not merely listen to the word of God and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And this is so key for us in the book of Jonah to realize that if Jonah would have just done what God had called him to do, that all of these events and all of this frustration and, and all of this dismay that Jonah and others uh, experienced because of his disobedience, if he would have just fell under the lordship it would have been so much better for him. And so it's important for us to understand that, that knowing something is not the same as doing something. There is a marriage that must take place before having revelation with God and doing that revelation and, and walking in the will of God. It's a lordship factor. And so what we believe is that, that Jonah, that was really at the, at the core of his issue. And I'll tell you here in a couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about 
why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh and, and to Assyria. We're going to talk about some, some underlying reasons why. But even with those underlying reasons, the base and the core of it was simply that God had called him to do something that he didn't want to do, and so he refused to do it. It was a lordship issue. So tonight what we want to do is we want to take a, a look at Jonah's story, and we just want to look at some real basic observations in regards to obedience and disobedience. And I really feel like these things will help us as we walk out the Christian life. So number one is simply this, that we learn from Jonah's life. When when I became a Christian, God called me to be a minister. Jonah, it was not just enough that he was a Hebrew. It was that he was one of God's chosen people, but he was also a prophet. God had called him to be a minister. In the New Testament, uh, under the new covenant of Jesus' blood, we find that not only are we as sons and daughters of God, not only are we saved and preserved for heaven, but in this life we're told that God has given us special giftings so that we can minister to other people. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, the Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. And so this spiritual gifting is kind of like when when we cross the threshold from death to life, we come to the Father as a son or a daughter, he, he embraces us and he welcomes us in, but it's not just that he has imparted to us eternal life, but in addition to eternal life, the Holy Spirit comes and he says, look, I have all these gems, these spiritual jewels that I'm going to impart into your spirit. These are giftings and I want you to take these giftings and I want you to use them and spread them and impart them to other people. And when you use these giftings, it will cause the entire body of believers to rise to a greater level. Um, It it simply means that um, we we don't have to have this, uh, you know, wild, extraordinary gift of prophecy in the way that Jonah did. We don't have to be a dynamic teacher or, or preacher or anything like that. Sometimes God imparts spiritual gifts that nobody will ever see. And it's not our responsibility to make sure that people see them. It's our responsibility just to be faithful to do them. So as a part of our responsibility as Christians, we are called to minister to other people. But in this situation, what we have is we have Jonah who has been given the spiritual gift of prophecy. And it works. We've seen in 2 Kings 14 where Jonah prophesies and everything that he says comes to pass. We have a prophet and God is using his prophetic gift and there's fruit that's, that's reaped from it. But we have a prophet who doesn't want to prophesy, right? And what we find when we look at that, it causes a great deal of introspection. We've got a guy who God says, look, I want you to go to these people. I want you to save these people. I want you to use your giftings for these people. And many of us would look at that and we would say, well, man, if I had a, if I had a prophetic gift as, as powerful as Jonah, I would have been the first one on the boat to go to Nineveh, not to Tarshish. But the reality is, is that if we're honest, before we get too harsh with Jonah here, we need to take a step back and and examine our own heart and our own lives and, and what God is doing and calling us to do in this moment. We got a prophet who doesn't want to use his giftings because it, he doesn't want these people to be saved. I would, I would venture to say that there's nobody in this room tonight that doesn't want a demographic of people to be saved. But the reality is, is that many Christians, they recognize that God has given them a gift. But just like Jonah, they run from it. It may not be for the same reasons that Jonah runs from it, but many of us have reasons that we don't want to use the gifts when God calls us to use them. I'll be honest with you, for me, one of my greatest um, issues with being obedient to what God has, has called me to do and using my gift is, is a sense of inferiority. It's a sense of insecurity. I'll sit in a room, especially at a church like this with, with the pastor and the pastors that we have on staff here. And, and I, I feel like God has, has given me a gift. But when I sit in a, in a room of incredibly gifted and anointed um, men and women, uh, you know, my instinct is, isn't to say, let me use my spiritual gift. My instinct is to take a step back because when I look around the room, I'll look at somebody else and say, they can probably do it better than I can. 
And honestly, if we're, if we're all being honest with ourselves, I would say that most people in the Christian life family probably wrestle with that far more than they wrestle with not wanting people to, you know, come to Christ or not wanting, you know, the, the spiritual fruitful results uh, that, that God hopes for. Most of us camp out in this area where, where we just feel like, although we've been given a spiritual gifting, that we're not good enough at it yet. We haven't matured in that gifting yet to be able to use it properly. But I'm going to tell you this, it's just like in golf, and I stink at golf, but I'm going to tell you this, the more I play golf, the better I get at golf. And I think the same is true for our spiritual giftings. We've got to be a people that exercise our giftings so that they mature, so that they develop, so that they get stronger. I was uh, I was raised about about 20 minutes outside um, where the Brownsville revival uh, took off in, in 1995. I was just a teenager um, when it all happened. And um, when I became a Christian, the revival had such a tremendous impact on my life and, and influenced me in amazing ways. I'm so thankful. And I remember listening to the pastor of the Brownsville Revival. His name is John Kilpatrick, and uh, he is still an amazing man of God, though he pastors another church now in Alabama. Um, but I remember there was a situation that, that came up in their, in their church. Even in the midst of revival, there were problems that break out. And uh, there were some people disagreeing with this side and this side. And so they had this, this kind of meeting where a bunch of different people came together and they were trying to sort these things out. And the pastor had in, in some ways been attacked about how he chose to do X, Y, or Z or whatever. And uh, I'll never forget this marked me. For, for 20 years, I've, I've camped out on this and I've, I've loved what he said so much. I remember listening to him stand up and in the midst of these people, he didn't come across as arrogant or prideful or anything like that. He was confident, but you really got the sense that what he was about to say was really coming from a, from a place of humility and, and a place of purity. And, and he, he humbly but confidently said this. He said, I may not be the smartest man in the world. As a matter of fact, I may not be the smartest man at this church. And I may not be the most gifted man at this church. And I may not have some of the spiritual gifting or the skill set as some other people at this church. He said, but if God has called me to pastor this church, then nobody on the planet can do it better than I can do it. And it was in that moment, I felt such a sense of confidence rise in me that I needed to be a person that, that pursued more than anything the will of God. Because if I found myself in the will of God, doing what God had called me to do, then I could with great humility and great confidence stand and say, listen, I may not be the best at what I'm doing, but God has called me to do this. And that means that nobody can do it better than I can do it. And I think for us, we've got to be a people that really embrace a mentality like that. If God has called you to do it, nobody can do it better than you can do it. And we need to, we need to stand in that. We need to walk in that and to be confident that God is going to bring about fruitful results, even in the midst of, of our insecurity. And so number two, it's important for me to understand that when I am called to minister to people, it is for them, but it's also for me. So we see in this narrative of Jonah, God clearly wants Nineveh to be purged of her sin. He wants a prophet to go in there and them to turn to Christ, to, to be purged of their sin. But Jonah, as much as it is about Nineveh being purged, it's also about Jonah being purged of some things that are deep, deep within him. We see in Jonah in this first chapter, we'll see some other things later, but even in this first chapter, we see the selfishness of Jonah revealed. It, it manifests itself just over and over and over again. At the very beginning, we see, obviously, Jonah refuses to do what God's called him to do. He doesn't have compassion. And so selfishly, he goes the other direction. When he finds himself in, in, in the ship and it's about to break apart and all these people are about to die, they go to Jonah, they wake him up and they say, Jonah, uh, you know, they're asking everybody, who has done this? What, who has done what to cause all this kind of stuff? Jonah doesn't come clean. He could have easily said, hey, fellas, it's my fault. I'm so sorry. Let me tell you what happened. But no, Jonah just kind of keeps it. He kind of hides it. And then they decide that they're going to cast lots. So Jonah is kind of found out in his sin. The third thing that Jonah does is super selfish. He, he, he looks at him and he says, listen, I know that I've sinned. I've refused to do this. I fled from the presence of the Lord. Um, but listen, I don't, if, if you guys want this storm to cease, just go ahead and throw me overboard. 
right? So Jonah doesn't say, I, I want to repent and go and do what God's called me to do and God will calm the storm. He says, no, I would rather take death over preaching to the Ninevites, right? Jonah, it, he hates the Ninevites so much that he is willing to selfishly die as opposed to give them an opportunity to turn to God in repentance. And then finally, if all this isn't bad enough, we see Jonah in the ship, they find out that Jonah has done this and he looks at him and he says, listen, if you want the storm to calm, you pick me up and throw me overboard, right? As if Jonah's legs were broken, as if he couldn't go to the side and just hop over himself. No, he puts the burden on the sailors. And he's like, look, we can all die together or you can kill me yourself, but I'm not gonna throw myself overboard. And so we see this tremendous selfishness inside of Jonah, which is sinful. And so we've got to understand that as much as God is trying to do something in Nineveh, he's trying to do something in Jonah. And when God calls me to minister to somebody, I am a wise person to ask the Lord, Father, what is it that you want to do in them? But Lord, as I go to minister, what is it that you want to do in me? Right. And so as we do that, God is always working. He is always purging. He is always trying to take us from glory to glory to glory. He is really trying to do something in us. And we see that in Jonah's life because Jonah had a whole lot to get purged out. Right. And the reality is, is that most of us have things that need to be purged out of us. The good news is this, is that God's purging is a pruning not a punishment. And I know uh, a lot of times these can sound like synonyms and I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but, but I do want to say this. I think it's important that we give definition to words. And I think sometimes we mistake as, as believers. I know that there have been times where I have mistaken the discipline of God for the punishment of God, right? And they're not the same thing. Discipline from the Lord comes from a father. Punishment comes from a judge. And so when I'm walking in disobedience or I do something, I find myself in a situation that I shouldn't be in, I've got to understand that, that although I may feel like God is pushing me away, the opposite is always true that because I'm a son, God is actually trying to pull me in. And so we've got to understand that there is a huge difference between um, purging and punishment. Purging is what God wanted to do to Nineveh before judgment. He didn't want to punish Nineveh. He wanted to purge Nineveh so that he wouldn't have to punish them. There is definitely a difference. And so when we see the life of Jonah and all these things unfolding, the, the storm and the ship and the, the fish and all these kind of things that seem to be working against Jonah, what we realize is that it's ultimately God really working for Jonah, right? I know this may sound kind of controversial and, you know, there may be some of you who disagree and, and listen, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. Um, but let me say this. I would go as far to say that the storm and the whale was more about God redirecting Jonah than it was God rebuking Jonah. I think it was more the father trying to say, Jonah, come close, come close and let me redirect you. He wasn't trying to rebuke him and to push him into punishment. He was saying, no, come close and let me guide you into what you need to be doing. And so when I find myself in a situation like that, I need to be sure that I am able to discern the difference between the loving discipline of God and the judgmental punishment of God. Paul would write this in Romans. He would say, look, it is the kindness of God that draws us to repentance. It's not the, it's not the arrogance of God or the judgment of God or the harshness of God. And, and God is judge. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God, God can be harsh when he needs to be. But I'm saying we're not just dealing with a supreme being that is a God. We are dealing with a supreme being that is a father. And we need to make sure that we understand that because when God calls us to minister, it's not just for a people. Oftentimes it's also for me. Number three is this, when I am in a storm, it may be the result of disobedience or it may be the result of obedience. 
One of the most fascinating things I love about Jonah is, is the parallel um, uh, situations you find Jonah in that Jesus himself was also in, right? Even Jesus said that um, his burial in the, in the heart of the earth would, would be likened to Jonah who was in the belly of a well for three days and three nights before they both came out. Um, it, in this story, you see Jonah at one point, he has found his place in the hull of a ship and he is sound asleep and there is a storm that is threatening to destroy the ship. And in Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter eight, you find Jesus in the same situation. He is in the hull of a ship. He is sound asleep. He is in the midst of a storm that's threatening to destroy the ship. The difference is simply this. Jonah found himself in that situation because of his disobedience, but Jesus found himself in that situation because of his obedience. Jonah found himself asleep in the hull of the ship because he had to cope some way with his disobedience toward God. But Jesus was asleep in the hull of the ship, not because of his disobedience, because he found comfort that he was obedient to God. And so therefore he was restful. And so it's important for us when we find ourselves in, in a storm or when we see other people going through really difficult situations, it is so important for us not to misdiagnose what's going on, right? Uh, I was reading an article, a medical journal, recently, and it was talking about how many Americans are misdiagnosed every single year. Did you know that upwards of 12 million patients every single year in the United States are misdiagnosed with something? And I'm not talking about, you know, well, we thought you had the flu, but it's really the common cold. Uh, we're talking about major things like we thought the tumor was cancerous, but it's benign. Or we thought the, the cancer was benign, but it's really cancerous or the tumor. And, and so there, there's a lot of misdiagnosis going on in the medical community. But can I be honest with you and just say that in the Christian community, a lot of times there's a lot of misdiagnosis that goes on. There are times where I will find myself in a really difficult place and I'll begin to question, Father, is this because, how have I been disobedient? What have I done? And oftentimes it's not because after I've searched my heart and the Lord has convinced me, it's not because I've done something wrong. It's because I've been doing something right. And so we need to be very careful, especially when we're looking at, at other people and situations they go through to make sure that we are not misdiagnosing. Because I'm going to tell you this, the older I get, the more I grow in my relationship with the Lord, the more I realize that things that happen in the kingdom of God are not cut and dry in the way that I once thought they were. They're not as black and white as, sometimes as, as I wish they were. The kingdom of God is often a lot of nuanced situations that are going on and we really don't know the whole of it. And frankly, we may never know the whole of it. Um, but we've got to, we've got to understand that um, sometimes when I find myself in difficulty, it's because of disobedience or obedience, and we need to let time play it out so we can discern what the difference is. Number four that we learn from Jonah is that when I obey, I can be sure of God's blessing. So sometimes that blessing comes in the form of just simply knowing that we have the pleasure of God on our lives, right? I was in a, a seminary class last summer and uh, uh, for, not a seminary, it was a master, I'm in a master's program and I was, um, taking a course and uh, we had a, a young professor, brilliant, godly, just amazing young professor. And he was talking about the Sabbath and how many Americans have forsaken the Sabbath and we haven't you know, honored the Lord with the Sabbath and all these kind of things. And uh, he was talking and one of the classmates just rose his hand and, and really coming from a really innocent, pure place, um, just simply said, um, man, this is so good. Could you tell us a little bit um, about the rewards of obeying the Sabbath? And the professor kind of turned and he looked and he made this statement. He said, the fruit of obedience is obedience. And what he was trying to say, I felt so bad for the guy that was in the class because he was honestly just asking, talk to us about, you know, the fruit that you've seen from it. And the professor was just basically saying, look, sometimes being obedient is just about being obedient. Sometimes it's not about what we receive. It's about the pleasure of God. Um, but then he went on later to talk about all 
the benefits that we get from honoring the Sabbath. So it was kind of a funny situation. But the point is, is that sometimes being obedient, it, the blessing in it is just knowing that we please the Lord. Other times we experience the blessing of the Lord in earthly reward. Um, earlier this year, uh, back in April, my wife and I, um, we adopted our, we have five children, but we have three that are adopted. We adopted our, our, uh, our third child and final child. Let me just say that. And, um, we were doing some fundraising because, um, adoptions just are not, uh, reasonable in, in our country. And, uh, we were doing fundraisers and so many people were just unbelievable in their generosity. Uh, one situation, I had a, a young couple come to us and they, they, uh, sent us some money and it was, it was not, chump change. It was upwards of like $3,000. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I immediately got in contact with them. I said, listen, thank you so much. And please don't take this the wrong way, but we cannot accept this much money from you guys. Um, you guys are young. You're, you're young married. I don't know your financial situation, but man, $3,000 is a lot of money for anybody, especially if you're younger and married. And um, he kicked back a little bit and he said, listen, he said, I appreciate what you're saying. He said, but I know the scripture tells us to be a generous people. And we felt quickened by the spirit of God that we should give you this amount of money out of generosity. And so, um, you know, naturally I, I, I conceded and I said, we'll, we'll gladly receive it. And, you know, the Lord bless you. And we prayed a prayer of blessing over them. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a call from, uh, from the husband and uh, he was talking to me and he said, you're never going to believe what happened. He said, you know, we, we felt like the Lord had spoken to us to give you this particular amount of money. We gave it to you. He said, then we had a financial situation that came up in our family that was like twice the amount of what we had given you. And we were just distraught. We didn't know what we were going to do. Um, he said, and then out of the blue, without ever knowing what we had given, we had a family member literally give us double the amount of money that we had gifted to you. And in that moment, I thought, man, God is just so good. God is so faithful to those who are obedient to his word and they hear and heed his spirit. And, and honestly, I even hate to, I, I hesitate to even use a financial illustration of that because the prosperity gospel is so perverted, the, the gospel. Um, but the reality is, is that God does bless generosity. God does bless his people in abundant ways. But my point of, of saying it is this, is that the more that, that I see people's lives and their experience and their walk with the Lord and, and my own and my family, I am more convinced than ever of this simple truth. That the richest kingdom treasures are buried deep in the fields of obedience. The richest kingdom treasures are buried deep in the fields of obedience. And that obedience isn't always something that is extraordinary. And it's not always something that is, that is way out there. And God asks you to give, you know, thousands of dollars. So it is not always like that. Sometimes obedience just means doing what I know I should do. Just being faithful, just honoring the Lord, honoring my family, being a good employee. These, these kind of things, these are, are acts of obedience, even if we don't recognize that they're acts of obedience. Uh, you find David in the Old Testament. Testament, uh, just before his defining moment with Goliath, we don't find David, you know, you know, using this great measure of faith before him. We don't see him living in such a way that, that brings him to this moment. We see David as a young boy who is just faithfully doing what his father has asked him to do. He is faithfully taking food from his father to his brothers day in and day out. And in the midst of that obedience, Goliath gets in the way. And when a Goliath gets in the way, all of a sudden, David's defining moment shows up on the scene and his obedience is seen in the blessing of God as David's name rise to, rises on the national stage. And so we got to understand that, that sometimes it's the pleasure of God, sometimes it's the earthly reward, but sometimes the blessing of obedience is an eternal reward. You know, just as well as I do, that there are people that have prayed and fasted and sought for the salvation of loved ones or people that have never come to Christ. They didn't see the, the, they didn't see the earthly reward, but their prayers are going to be honored in heaven one day. We know people that have given financially, they have given and no soul on this earth. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6. No soul on earth has ever known it and never will know it. But guess who knows it? Heaven knows it. 
and heaven rewards those who are faithful to do what God has called them to do. I think that one of the most concerning things in my life and in so many Christians' lives that I have found is simply this, that so many people are convinced that if they disobey God, that they are going to reap his judgment swiftly and fiercely. But they are not convinced that if they obey God, that they will reap his blessing and favor immediately in their lives. And honestly, what that tells about us is it shows us our perception of our Father in heaven. And we've got to be real careful with that. He is a Father who loves to give gifts. Jesus said, look, if you go to the Father and you ask him to give you this, he's not going to give you that. What you go and ask him for, he may give you, but he may give you even more than what you can imagine because he wants your life to be full of life and full of joy and full of hope. God wants to bless us in this life. But number five, just as sure as I can be, um, I can be assured of God's blessing when I obey, I can be assured of frustration when I disobey. Uh, at my home right now, we are basically, I don't know if remodeling our home is the right terminology or not, but uh, in, in the past year, we've got new carpet. We've, we've had to paint our walls because we have five children and we have lived in our house. And um, my wife has, has bought, um, you know, uh, new dressers for, for the kids from Ikea and stuff like that. I have put together more Ikea furniture in the past three weeks than I ever have in my life up to this point. Um, but nonetheless, the, the point is this is that if I choose to pay attention to the instruction manual that was written by the creators of this product, right? If I choose to pay attention and do what they're telling me to do, I can be assured that my family is gonna enjoy a good product, a good bed or a good dresser or whatever the case may be. They're not gonna have to worry about their bed falling apart in the middle of the night. Why? Because daddy followed the instructions that the creator of the product had given them to do. But I've learned the hard way that if I don't go by the instructions that I've been given, it is surely going to lead to frustration. I can't tell you how many times I have put something together thinking that I don't need the instructions, thinking I don't need to listen to the one who created it, thinking I can just push it to the side. I have tried to put things together and they were monstrosities. They looked nothing like they were supposed to look. I ended up goofing on it. And as a result, my family ended up frustrated because the product didn't turn out the way that it was supposed to turn out. And so we've got to be rest assured. When God gives us certain instructions, it's for our betterment. It's because he knows how things are gonna play out. He doesn't want us to live in frustration. He wants us to live in his presence, in his blessing. But when we choose to go our own way, when we choose to disobey, we can be rest assured that we will be frustrated from time to time. Notice the metaphor in the book of Jonah. Three different times in the first chapter, the Bible says that Jonah went down to Joppa, that Jonah went down into the hole of the ship, that Jonah went down into to the belly of the fish. Over and over and over again, we see this metaphor that Jonah went down. And the metaphor relates to what's going on with Jonah in a spiritual sense. Because of his disobedience, he is spiritually descending. He continues and continues and continues to defy and not repent of what God has called him to do. And in the midst of that, his disobedience is costing not only him, but it's costing other people. But can I just tell you this, that disobedience is more than just losing a blessing or losing a fruitful life or losing a, a, a certain result that we want to have. Uh, disobeying the Lord, there is a loss of the concentrated presence of God. See, the Bible says that Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord. We know that we can't, David said, if I go to the heavens, if I descend into, into Sheol, uh, it, there's nowhere that I can go where the Lord is not. He is, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere. We know that Jonah could never flee from the presence of the Lord, but I can tell you what Jonah could do. Jonah could lose the presence of the Lord by choosing to disobey the Lord. And I, I need to be real careful. I know that, that that can be taken way, you know, to an extreme. I'm just simply saying this, 
that when I live in persistent disobedience to what the Lord has called me to do, there is sometimes a sense of distancing from the Lord that I will sense. But even then again, that distancing that the Lord is doing is really bringing my attention that there's a problem here. He's really, even in his, his pulling away, he's really trying to pull me close because he has the heart of a father. And so tonight as we close, I just want to remind us that obedience, walking in the will of God, the favor of God, the blessing of the Lord, it's more about our desires than it is our deeds. But I want to make this clear. When we have the proper desires, it manifests itself in the proper deeds. And so I can be rest assured that, that when things are right with me and the Lord internally, and he is truly the Lord of my life, my desires are, are purified and my motives are right, that these desires are going to turn into deeds at some point in time, the way that they did for Jonah. But I can always and forever whether I like what God has called me to do or I disapprove of what God has called me to do, I can forever be comforted by this fact that God will never ask me to do anything that is not best for me. It may not feel like it's best for me, but God will never ask me to do something that is not best for me. And that's how we end Jonah chapter one. Next uh, Wednesday, we'll pick up with Jonah in the belly of the sea creature. And I look so forward to seeing you so much. I missed you tonight. I love you so much. The Lord bless you. Thanks so much and have a great night.